Discord. All right, so welcome everyone, and uh, thank you for tuning in. So this is a new uh, seminar series that we are hoping to to host uh, maybe every every other week uh, in Lyon. And uh, so today, uh, to start the series, our first speaker is uh, Laurent Fredel from Perimeter Institute, and he will tell us about uh, gravitational edge modes, quadrant orbits, and hydrodynamics. So Laurent, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, Mark. Uh, I'm happy to start this new series uh, online and tell you about, uh, about this work. And happy birthday, uh, Etera. Um, cannot say this is your present, but here it is. So I want to talk about uh, 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 this work that uh, um, I've been doing with William Donnelly, Farouj Moussavian, and Anthony Speranza. And I'm going to focus entirely on this work, although you know it, it is related to the work uh, I recently did with, with Daniel and Mark, but I won't have time to talk about the connection. And uh, I'm going to explain, it's going to be a quite technical talk because it's very focused, but uh, in this talk we're going to connect different uh, uh, um, fields like uh, you know gravitational edge modes to cogent orbit, which is techniques and hydrodynamics, which was a surprising connection, at least to to us. <clears throat> now, um, the fundamental question, uh, one of the fundamental the fundamental question I really want to focus on in today in uh, uh, in quantum gravity is is what are the fundamental degrees of freedom. Another way to ask the same question is to say, well, what is really this geometrical entropy uh, accounting? What kind of states, what kind of uh, uh, objects? So uh, there's really two strategies we can have there. And uh, one strategy, the one which has been applied for the past, let's say 30 years, is that we can just uh, start and make wild guesses about what is the Planckian nature of, this, of these degrees of freedom. And, and claim that these are strings or loops or causal sets or brains or uh, whatever. Or another strategy is that we can start to use the information available to us in the semi-classical theory to try to understand a little bit better uh, uh, what these degrees of freedom should look like. And, and the fact, there is a new perspective which is now emerging uh, uh, very recently. And the fact there is a new perspective come from uh, the combination of three uh, elements. The first is that we're asking a new fundamental question. And by we, I mean, you know, the, globally, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, the community as a whole. We are asking a new fundamental question. The second thing is that we are developing a new technical tool that allow us to cut through. And, and uh, what I want to also claim is that we're following a new principle, a new paradigm. So the, the new fundamental question is, it's a very simple question, which is how does a space-time region can be decomposed into sub-region? It's a very simple question because if I was on a blackboard and I was writing with a choke, uh, and I was asking the question, what is inside that choke? I would, I would break that choke open to see what's inside that choke. And, 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 and the same thing for space. So if you want to understand what space is made of, well, the simplest thing we can start to think is, what happens if we cut space open? And, and, and is it even possible to get, uh, cut space open? And under what condition can we do that? And uh, the, you know, this question could be also asked in, into, as follow, like about what is the fundamental nature of entanglement across the bridge? So that's the first point. The, the second thing is, uh, as many of you know, uh, um, and have contributed recently to it, uh, the new tool is really this covariant phase space that allow us to kind of look at the canonical structure of gravity through many different lenses and, and gives us a peek inside the nature of quantum gravity. And uh, the new principle is what I call a local holography. Now, um, there are many notions of holography, so let me try to precise what I mean by local holography. So, uh, I, can, I can see that there are like so far three notions of holography. So the most well-known holography is ADS-CFT holography. Uh, in this holography, the boundary is a time-like boundary, which is asymptotic. Uh, it's a boundary which is rigidly defined uh, by a boundary uh, condition, usually a Dirichlet boundary condition. And this Dirichlet boundary condition kill all symplectic flux at infinity. So this is an holography that does not allow outgoing radiation. What this means is that it means that it creates a closed system and the system is closed and unitary by design. 
So uh, when people tell you that you know holography proves unitarity, I would say no, it's really unitary by design. There, uh, uh, you're, you're killing all symplectic blocks. Um, a more recent version of holography, which is um, in some sense more interesting uh, uh, from that respect, is celestial holography. In that, in that holography, the boundary is asymptotic, but it's null. Uh, now it's less rigidly defined, it's defined only by, by fall of condition, and it's not just simply a Dirichlet boundary condition. Uh, and it does allow, what's interesting about this holography is that it does allow uh, radiation. We can now study time evolution, uh, uh, um, and it means that the system is open and allow energy loss. Okay, uh, the local holography uh, um, I want to uh, study um, is different in the sense that you require the choice of a Cauchy domain and it's attached to a finite uh, surface that we call the corner. And this one does not require uh, any boundary condition. So in some sense, you can view that in some sense, local holography is a subset of celestial holography, which is kind of a subset of uh, the more rigid ADS type of holography, if you want. Uh, so there's kind of a nesting of, of structure. And the nesting of structure is, is, is uh, you know, is by, you go from one structure to the, to the other by, by relaxing some of our boundary conditions. And of course, these, you know, connections haven't been yet uh, uh, um, uh, written or understood uh, properly, but that's kind of uh, the general idea. So I'm going to focus on this local holography. Uh, what's interesting is that each holography is associated with a symmetry group. So it's conformal symmetry for ADS holography, uh, extended BMS symmetry, for uh, celestial holography or, or the corner symmetry for the local holography. So uh, let me try to uh, present a little bit more um, uh, how we do that um, and, and how we decompose the gravitational uh, system into subsystem. Um, now, the system we're going to, to consider for us, a gravitational subsystem is defined on a, the symplectic structure, of, you know, the phase space structure of your, of your physical theory, gravity theory, on a given slice, sigma. And then uh, we want to decompose, we want to understand what happens when you start to decompose sigma into subregions. So you, you cut up and then you, de you, you decide that sigma is made of uh, subsets like that, sigma one, sigma two, glued. And these surfaces are glued uh, uh, along each other on the slice. Uh, uh, along uh, um, pieces of two-dimensional spheres, okay? Um, now, if you want to understand how to extend this, this uh, uh, initial data set uh, into space-time, we're going to uh, take a slicing where each domain, uh, uh, each sigma i, is, is itself a Cauchy slice for its evolution. So the idea is that if you give me a little domain uh, in space-time, I can look at the domain of dependence there, um, and essentially choose a time slicing, which goes like that, right? So this is my initial slice here. This is S, it's my entangling sphere. I can always choose a time slicing where time, this entangling sphere does not evolve in time. Uh, and, and, and I have a time evolution inside uh, of each domain that uh, uh, asymptote, if you want to, uh, uh, a light cone there, okay? Uh, and, and the fact, uh, so this, this situation is, is familiar for people who study black hole, but there's no reason to, sub, to, to where S would be the, uh, uh, the bifurcation surface and, and the time evolution would be the killing, asymptotic killing uh, 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 evolution, but there's no reason to restrict to that situation. Uh, and the fundamental question, um, uh, so at the classical level, it's pretty clear, you know, how you would do that and how you would build and glue together the different pieces. Um, so the question is that we want to do that now at the quantum level and, and, and how do we decompose the, the, the full Hilbert space? So now um, in usual quantum field theory, we know that the vacua is entangled, but it, you know, even if the vacua is entangled, uh, we can still decompose the Hilbert space uh, and factorize it as a, as a tensor product Hilbert space. The fact that the vacua is entangled means that these different factors are not going to be orthogonal to each other, but there's still a notion of local decompositions of, uh, uh, yeah, and of operators. Okay, now in gravity, and gauge invariance prevents the factorization of Hilbert space. So the Hilbert space is not factorizable. You cannot just decompose the Hilbert space of theory into a product of Hilbert space attached to uh, each region. And the, and the reason uh, um, is well known. Uh, it's just uh, the fact that uh, um, gauge invariance forces observable to be non-local. So let's say if I you know, draw an observable, which would be 
a gauge theory observable, not a gravity observable, but a gauge theory observable, you know, it could be a Wilson loop and this Wilson loop can span, you know, uh, cut across different subs uh, subsystems. So when I cut up on the subsystems, I end up uh, cutting up on that observable. And if I don't uh, add up somehow uh, neutralizing charges or dressing uh, uh, at the end of this cut, uh, then the observables are not gauge invariants, and therefore they are not they are not operator I can use to create my state. So I need to add these uh, extra boundary charges. That's essentially the edge modes, uh, um, which are necessary to uh, uh, restore the proper entanglement between uh, uh, regions. That's the region the reason why we can't um, we can't decompose the, the Hilbert state. Now to resolve this puzzle. Uh, I mean, what we, what we focused on in, in, with William in 2016 is really the resolution of this puzzle. What we do is that we need to introduce the additional degrees of freedom, uh, which are this uh, edge mode localized at the boundary, uh, um, uh, which essentially you know, neutralizes, if you want, the, the, the cut. And, and therefore, uh, this means that we're defining an extension of the Hilbert space. Okay. Uh, this extension has been proven to be necessary to recover the proper uh, uh, entanglement entropy in gauge theory. Uh, this is a very nice work by William and, and Aaron Wall. Um, and, and the reason you know, you, this is happening, um, um, we, we saw it, is that somehow when you introduce a boundary, uh, uh, the, gauge, the gauge symmetry is broken at the boundary. Um, so what that means, though, uh, it means that the, this, this uh, extension on this uh, uh, edge mode structure is not arbitrary. These edge modes uh, form a representation of a symmetry group. And, and this is the symmetry group that uh, we call the corner symmetry group and denote uh, GS here. Now, once you have a symmetry group attached with, with the boundary of each region, then you want to glue back the, the boundary between two regions. Um, you can uh, uh, do that uh, not by uh, um, uh, uh, a tensor product, but by a fusion product, a fusion product which is defined essentially by demanding that, that so you have a representation attached to the boundary of each uh, of your, of your uh, uh, corners, and you demand that the, when you glue back, the, the operation of gluing it back the, is the demand that the, the states is, is singlet. Uh, under this representation. And technically, this means that you have a representation of the generator of the corner symmetry on the left, on the, you know, on the surface one, and then on the surface two, they intersect uh, uh, on the corner S12. So we have a slice one, a slice two, and we have on the boundary these two charges. And uh, these two charges are independent when the, the cut is open, and the gluing back is the demand that uh, um, they are uh, identified. and that, and that creates a fundamental source of entanglement, uh, which goes way beyond uh, uh, the field theory uh, level of entanglement. Um, so any question about uh, that general picture? Uh, might be a good point to, uh, to ask before, because this is somehow kind of the general framework and I'm going to focus more on, on, on um, what is this particular group of symmetry. Okay, so if there is no question, um, if it's all clear, uh, let me focus on the, the, the subject of that talk. Okay, so the subject of that talk is to focus now on gravity and, and study a bit more what is this symmetry group um, and what can we do with it. So for metric gravity, um, so um, here I'm going to focus on the, on the einstein hilbert formulation of gravity. And uh, with William uh, um, in 2016, we showed that this corner symmetry group has this uh, semi-direct product structure, which is, uh, uh, there's an homogeneous factor here, which is the uh, deformorphism of the surface. Uh, and the semi-direct factor uh, is uh, the sets of function on the surface value into uh, the Lie algebra SL2R, okay? Um, the exact uh, form of the boundary symmetry group, interestingly, depends a little bit on the, on the formulation. And we have explored uh, this dependence with uh, Mark and Daniel. But here I'm going to focus on that 
uh, formulation. And in some sense, this group is kind of universal. Uh, it belongs, it belongs, it's there, it belongs to any formulation of gravity. And the reason it's, it's universal is because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a purely geometrical group attached to uh, uh, the fact that I have a two sphere uh, S embedded into a, a Lorentzian space time, a 4D Lorentzian space time. Okay. Um, in fact, in fact, this group is the same even in higher dimension. Uh, um, okay, so how does it work? Uh, um, this group of symmetry is really so you know. Suppose you choose a two sphere somewhere, which is going to be your entangling uh, a sphere, and this sphere is embedded in four D. Now, uh, because it's embedded into a higher dimensional space time, um, uh, there is a canonical bundle attached to this two sphere, which is the normal bundle. Um, that is, if you look at the tangent space of that two sphere, there is uh, vectors which are tangent to the sphere, uh, but there's also ve vectors which are normal to the sphere. And um, th the canonical bundle is the normal bundle uh, of the normal direction of the sphere. Okay, and because we have a metric, it's possible to, to define this normal bundle, which is a decomposition of the tangent bundle as a, as an orthogonal decomposition. Okay, so what are, and once you have a bundle, it's very natural to say that the symmetry group, uh, it's like, you know, of that, of that structure is the automorphism group of the normal bundle. And that's what GS is. Uh, part of the automorphism group is, you know, simply just the diffeomorphism of the base as usual. But there's also, there's also part of the, uh, uh, of the symmetry group, which is the transformation of the, of the fiber. And, and um, here, um, this is this uh, SL2RS, that is functions on the sphere value into SL2R. Uh, you can think of them as super boost. What, what they represent, they represent uh, uh, vectors on the sphere which vanish at the location of the sphere and possesses uh, uh, non-vanishing first derivative. Okay, so now the geometry of this object uh, contains a metric. So now we're we are used to the fact that in uh, co-dimension one, essentially there is intrinsic geometry and extrinsic geometry and the intrinsic geometry is simply the metric, the induced metric, okay? Here for co-dimension two, it's more interesting because the intrinsic geometry contains uh, uh, the metric uh, QAB, but it also contains uh, another structure, which is the normal connection there. And the normal connection is essentially that you look at uh, the covariant derivative acting on a normal vector, and then project it back onto a normal vector. Okay, so that's this definition. Uh, once you have this normal connection, uh, you have a notion of outer curvature, which is simply the curvature of this normal connection. And because the bundle is two dimensional, uh, uh, this curvature is essentially a two form on the sphere. Okay, so that's, that's a fundamental uh, element. So for a two sphere embedded in 4D, the intrinsic geometry is a metric and a two form, which is the outer curvature. Uh, the last point is that the fact that the group of symmetry is SL2R and not GL2R uh, is due to the fact that the, 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 the GL2R, the homogeneous component of GL2R can be shown in metric gravity to be just pure gauge. So, so this is the, the leftover symmetry. Any question about that geometrical picture and how universal that is? If not, um, I'll move on. Now, in quantum gravity, any physical observable inside a region, um, so this is really the, the core of local holography. Any physical observable inside a region sigma suggests a density matrix, correlation function, whatever you're thinking uh, uh, of measuring inside, will organize it according to the representation theory of the corner symmetry. So for instance, if I'm thinking about the density matrix, uh, uh, um, what I'm saying is that the density matrix is gonna be block diagonal, uh, um, and so these, uh, and, and you know, the block diagonals, the blocks are going to be labeled by unitary representation of this corner symmetry group. So I can think of these representations as uh, a quantum analog of, you know, as super selection sectors. If you want. Um, now the least we can do, and this sounds like a very uh, general statement, but I think this is, this is where I'm going. Really the least we can do, the minimal things we can do if we want to understand quantum gravity, and its subdivision property is to understand what are these unitary representations for this particular group, which is kind of a universal group of symmetry uh, attached to quantum gravity. And, and on the other hand, I would say any theory of quantum gravity should provide us of a form of maybe deformation, but some should tell us something about uh, how it deals with this symmetry. 
and uh, that that's kind of the new element. So it means that you know we need to understand, or I I really want to understand uh, what this uh, symmetric group and, and their representation do. So now we don't have a theory of quantum gravity, so I cannot just check that it's there. Uh, but we can use something which is very powerful. We can use a very powerful semi-classical analysis, which is the coherent, coherent orbit method of Kirillov, Constant, and Soria, which I'm now going to, to present. So the coherent orbit method, uh, um, what, what it is is that it's a, it's, a, it's a technique that gives us somehow um, a window inside the quantum world and can, can allow us to extract a lot of information about quantum gravity, in the, even in the absence of, uh, of a quantum field. Uh, the coherent orbit method is a profound correspondence, correspondence between unitary representations of Lie group and coherent orbits, uh, uh, satisfying certain quantization conditions. So it has been established uh, uh, very widely. It's more, if you want, uh, uh, it's more like a, a program or a manifesto. It's not like a general theorem that apply, you know, uh, as a blanket theorem to all the groups. You have to work the details for every group. But now, by now, you know, it has been established for nilpotent group, compact group, non-compact group, reductive group, and even, and that's the point of interest to us, infinite dimensional group. So if you look at infinite dimensional groups, uh, the first one to really uh, uh, use it to classify representation of a uh, loop group was Frankel. For, for centrally extended loop algebra. Uh, then uh, Witten uh, did a, a very beautiful work classifying all the representations of Virasoro algebra using that, and even more recently, uh, computing all the Virasoro characters uh, uh, using these techniques. Um, now, um, uh, people working in hydrodynamics, like Arnold, that pioneered the, the Hamiltonian analysis of hydrodynamics, uh, started the study of that. And more recently, uh, Kezin, uh, um, uh, completed the, the complete classifications for area preserving diffeomorphisms. Um, there's also a very recent work of Varnish and Oblak where, where they did a similar work for the DMS uh, uh, algebra. And we're going to borrow a lot from these two work, from Varnish, Oblak, and Arnold Kazin. We can see that what I'm going to present is kind of, kind of a fusion or extension of both these works. So once you have these coagent orbit methods, what it does is that it gives you access to understanding what are the Casimirs. What are the, the Casimirs corresponds to the orbit invariants, uh, uh, which, and the Casimirs are, are the same thing as the weights, if you want, of the representations. Uh, it turns out also to, to compute the characters, which are the orbit integrals, and it gives you access to what is the Planchfeld measure. That is how you, you sum uh, the representations together uh, and construct an identity decomposition. And a key element about the coagent orbit is it's universal. That is, any time you have a phase space which is acted upon by the group, there's going to be a moment map. That is a map from your phase space to these coagent uh, uh, orbits, which provides the representations of the symmetry generated. So understanding how the, the, this, uh, this action is represented is essentially constructing this moment map. Um, okay, so let me just uh, describe for people that are not familiar with this uh, coagent orbit. Uh, uh, let me just re recall some elements. So if I have a Lie group, G, uh, and uh, Lie algebra, uh, uh, small g, and it's dual, G star, I can, const you know, I'm going to define a, a group element G, a Lie algebra element, and P is going to be denote a dual element. Um, we have a canonical, the fact that G and G dual are, uh, are in duality, it means that we have a canonical P pairing that maps two elements P and X to you know, uh, um, a real number. And then we have a coagent representation uh, denoted by add star, which is essentially given by the conjugate of the adjoint representation, which is just the, simply the conjugation. And the fact that we map G to G minus one is just to preserve the, the left action. Uh, Okay, so now what is the geometry of a coagent orbit? Uh, let's suppose that we take a, a given point, P0, uh, uh, in G star, in the dual Lie algebra. Now, uh, the orbit under this action at star is by definition the coagent orbit and is labeled by this point P0. Uh, what, what's happening is that uh, this orbit is always going to be an homogeneous space. So it's gonna be the quotient of the group divided by a stabilizer group. Uh, um, and uh, that I denote H uh, P zero here. Uh, do you see my my pointer? 
I, I'm assuming you see my pointer. Yeah, we do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, and the fundamental theorem of uh, Kirillov constant Surio is, is the fact that uh, any quadrant orbit is a symplectic manifold. And this is a very powerful uh, uh, theorem. Um, so the way it works, uh, I mean, essentially I'm going to write, uh, is, is uh, just to write down what is the symplectic structure and check that it has all the, uh, the property. So if I take a point in the orbit, it's going to be uh, you know, a point which is uh, obtained by taking P0 and acting uh, on it with the agent action within the group element G, okay? Um, <clears throat> now for such a point, the, the, the symplectic structure at this point can be written as uh, the pairing of this point P with uh, the wedge product of, uh, of moer carton uh, uh, forms, like right invariant forms, okay? So that's essentially the, the formula. Now, once you have that formula, um, I won't do it here, but it's, it's easy to see that uh, if I, if I you know, uh, multiply on the right by an element of the stabilizer, uh, that is an element which is in H0, HP0, then, um, um, this, this action on the right by element of the stabilizer is in the kernel of omega p, okay? So it means that the kernel of this, and, and that's all there is, that is the kernel of, of the symplectic form is essentially vector tangent to the stabilizer group. And that's, that's, a, that's exactly what we need to show that, uh, uh, um, that uh, you know, this, this symplectic form is non-degenerate on the orbit. Um, okay, because the tangent space of the, of the orbit is essentially the tangent space of G modulo vectors in the stabilizers. Okay, and then the, the symplectic, it's a symplectic form, it's closed, and this follows simply by uh, uh, Jacobi identity. Okay, so now uh, let me give you a few uh, examples of these uh, coagent orbit methods uh, here uh, and, uh, uh, and give you a sense you know, a feel that somehow it's clear that there's a correspondence between a one-to-one -one correspondence between coagent orbit and representation. So once you develop this geometrical understanding of coagent orbit, uh, initially you're doing geometry and after a while, you're really doing quantum mechanics. And, and, and the transition is so smooth that uh, it's, it's a little bit hairy in some sense, like the more familiar you become with the geometry of coagent orbit, the more and more you recognize pattern uh, unique to uh, quantum mechanics, if you want. So for, for the, you know, simply say a compact group like uh, SU2, the rotation group, well, G and G star are both, uh, because there's a canonical pairing are both uh, uh, R3, they are isomorphic to each other. And the coagent orbits there are the same thing as the orbits, they're simply spheres of radius uh, given by modulus of P. Uh, now on, on the 2D sphere, there's an invariant volume form, SU2, and that's uh, the, up to a scale, that's the, the the, which is the radius of the sphere, um, this form, uh, this volume form is, is the Kirillov constant Soryo form. Okay, now the, the isotropy group, the stabilizer group for this orbit is uh, U1, it's the, it's the rotation that preserves that vector. And because it's compact, uh, uh, um, there's a quantization condition. So the invariance orbits are really the, the, the orbits of radius which belongs, which are integer orbits. Okay. So, and for all compact groups, it works exactly the same. Um, and for compact groups, there's extra structure. That is, there's a, always, a, this invariant volume form is always scalar. So there's always a canonical uh, complex structure and you can use to define creation and annihilation operator. Okay. So let's go to now to a non-compact group like SL2R. It's going to be one of our building blocks. In that case, G and G star are also uh, given by R3. Uh, now, uh, the structure of the orbit is more interesting um, in the sense that first there is like generic orbits and uh, degenerate orbits. So there's different class of orbits. So the generic orbits are, are hyperboloids and they're just labeled by the heights, if you want. Uh, so they're labeled by whether they are time-like or space-like. So we have, a, you know, we have a one chili the hyperboloid, which is a, a time-like surface and we have the two, sorry, the, yeah, one chili hyperboloid is time-like surface. And then um, we have the, the, 
the upper sheet or the lower sheet hyperboloid, which are uh, space-like surface. So the ones which are, let's say, the space-like surface are similar to the compact orbit in the sense that their isotropy group is U1 and they satisfy a, 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 a quantization condition. So this is the discrete, they correspond to the discrete series of SL2. Um, the one sheeted hyperboloid, in fact, is the one that uh, uh, I'm going to enter in our construction. Um, um, the isotropy group, the stabilizer group is, uh, is simply R. Uh, it's a boost group. And, and this means that uh, this corresponds, uh, this, this subject corresponds to the continuous series. And now, uh, okay, there's the degenerate series, which is a mass zero, which is here the light cones, um, which are not just simply labeled by, by the, the invariants. You know, you need extra labels to understand the geometry. But there are, there are always uh, boundaries between the, the different sectors. So this is, this is all for compact and non-compact groups. Uh, Okay, so let's go to the next uh, example, which would be a key example. And if there is questions about, you know, orbits and this geometry, uh, don't be shy. Laurent? Yes. Hi, hi, I have a question. Sorry, uh, just a technical. Yeah. Go. Just a technical point on the previous slide. Yeah. Uh, when you write uh, omega p, uh, that, is a, uh, that is actually a number, right? So uh, it should be an object, uh, but you can write it as a two form, right? Like an it object is, in. Yeah, it is a two form here. It is a two form at P. Look, it's a DG G minus one. Yeah, okay. But uh, it, it, I, I don't see that. I mean, what do you mean it is a two form? Because the, the Morer carton uh, DG G minus one is a one form, okay? So if you want, you can, I can write what is omega p evaluated at the, uh, the wedge product of x and y, okay? And this will be p, the commutator of the x and y uh, Lie algebra elements. Ah, okay, sorry. So as written here, it is a two form. It's not an yes. element of R. You have to supply two elements of the algebra to give a I number. Okay. If I give you two elements of the algebra, then I get a number. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you. It is a, yeah, it's usually written in the other way, but I, you know, I always like it to write. Things a little bit differently. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay. So. Um, okay. So now let's move on to uh, something which is more at the core of what we're doing. Okay. So far, maybe you know it was familiar that finite groups and you know finite dimensional groups are there, but we are studying uh, infinite dimensional groups. Okay. And. Um, the first infinite dimensional group that was really studied seriously in the mathematical physics literature is not a loop algebra, it's not Virazo algebra, it's uh, the area preserving diffeomorphism group. And the reason it was studied uh, uh, is mostly due to Arnold that realized that this, is, this group is the group of symmetry of incompressible hydrodynamics. Uh, he studied the, the Euler equation and, and, and show that there's a, you know, the Euler equation uh, contains an infinite dimensional symmetry group, uh, which is this group. And this group, of course, is, is the group of, uh, sorry, I call it area preserving diffeomorphism, but it's really the group of diffeomorphism that preserves uh, um, uh, a density on your manifold, okay? So the fluid density. Uh, so the Lie algebra of these groups are vector fields on your manifold, which are divergent uh, free. Okay, they satisfy this condition. Okay, so now the dual Lie algebra is of a different nature. Uh, you want to get uh, objects that when paired with the vector gives you a, a scalar. So first, uh, there are, they are one forms, but you know, uh, it's not enough just to be a one form. They have to be density value one form. Okay, so they have to contain a factor rho, which is a density in fact. Okay, and you can think of P as being the momenta of the free P tilde. So the tilde refer to the density weight, if you want, it's a density one. Um, so uh, the P tilde is the momenta of the free and the P, the de-densitized uh, object is the free velocity. And this is literally what it is uh, uh, in free mechanics. Now, once you have these uh, objects, there's clearly a pairing between momenta and <clears throat> the generators. Uh, which is uh, obtained by integrating over S, the, the, the momenta density contracted with the vector, okay? Now, because of the incompressibility of the fluid and the fact that this object is divergent, let's, it's clear that if I change the 
<coughs> the velocity by an exact form, uh, you know, um, this doesn't change the pairing. So this object is really is really in the kernel. So in fact, the dual is not just a, it's a one form, but it's one form modulo uh, um, uh, modulo exact. So it's, they are one densitized one form modulo densitized uh, uh, exact one uh, exact forms. Okay, so this is the, the coagent orbit. On a topology like the sphere, it means that you can map the, uh, essentially the dual vectors uh, um, into the gauge invariant sectors, which is, uh, so, you know, which is essentially labeled by the vorticity. Okay, so the vorticity is you take the velocity, you take its divergence, of course it's invariant under this translation, and that's labeled an element of the dual Lie algebra. Okay. Uh, and the fluid vorticity is uh, a two form here living on the sphere. Okay, so this is uh, uh, um, what the, in fact, uh, sorry, this is missing. I should not say, uh, uh, there should not be an equality sign here. There should be an inclusion sign and the equality sign should be uh, uh, for G star should be on the sets of vorticity. Okay, and now we can construct. So once you have this uh, 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 coagent, uh, action, you are interested in classifying the invariants, that is what type of orbits, what replaces, in, if you want, the radius that we talk about of the sphere or the height of the hyperboloid. That's the invariant that, that classify the orbits. And in the case of uh, incompressible fluids, uh, the invariants are uh, called uh, anstrophy, uh, strange names. They're essentially the moment of the vorticity. So the vorticity is a two form here, but you have also a fluid density that you, you can think of it as a, as a two form. And you can therefore uh, uh, construct the dual, uh, the Hodge dual of the vorticity, uh, uh, which is a function on the sphere, okay? And now you can take the moments, you can, you know, because it's a function, you can take an arbitrary power of this uh, uh, vorticity function and integrate it uh, over the sphere against the fluid density. And this is the fluid anstrophy. And the main theorem of Euler was to show that this uh, anstrophy or, uh, uh, are conserved in a, in a Eulerian fluid. Okay, any questions about that? Because this is maybe not familiar for people who work in gravity or quantum gravity. Uh, okay. So, uh, sorry, hi, sorry, hi, Lohan. Mm -hmm. uh, I, have a, I have a question. Uh, what is CA? Yeah, CA? Uh, yeah, yeah. This, this is the vector, it's a vector field on this year. So uh, the algebra, the group is the uh, diffeomorphism group, okay? So yes. the Lie algebra is the algebra of vector field. Yeah. Okay, that generates uh, infinitesimal diffeomorphism. Okay, okay. so and uh, wh why are divergence uh, log CA are vanishes? That's the definition of uh, uh, free, you know, area preserving diffeomorphism. That's, that's a subgroup. You can check that if uh, the vector field satisfies this condition, then the Lie bracket of vector field also satisfies this condition. Oh, okay. okay. So, uh, so this uh, is the group, the group of, of transformation that preserve a fixed density. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Okay, it's it's a it's a simple uh, um, sub subgroup of the diffeomorphism, and in fact, it's it's interesting. It's important to to appreciate that when you have the diffeomorphism group, there's a canonical subgroup, and and you have a, a, a density, there's a canonical subgroup embedded. In it. Okay, so. Uh, let's go now to the gravitational symmetry algebra, which is the guy we're interested in. And in that case, uh, it's a semi-direct product. So uh, uh, the Lie algebra is labeled by pairs, you know, vector field <coughs> on the sphere and the Lie value uh, function alpha, which is a, a value into the Lie algebra, the tau a are the Lie algebra generators. And the commutator is simply, you know, for the vector fields, the Lie algebra commutator, that's simple. And then um, these uh, vector fields act on, on my Lie algebra element by Lie derivative. And there's also a commutator of, of uh, the Lie algebra elements itself. So that's uh, the, the, the usual structure of, um, of a Lie algebra uh, where DFS acts on the function for you into SL2R. Now, uh, the dual of this Lie algebra contains two pieces. One piece uh, is p which is, we have seen it already, it's the density value one form. 
And the other piece, uh, until it's an SL to R value density, and it's important that I need density because I'm going to need to be able to integrate uh, this object. And the pairing is uh, between PT lentil and Xi alpha is essentially the integral of the sphere of these uh, contractions of vectors with forms and, and, um, and the algebra elements. Okay. Uh, and the coagent action, okay, it's a little bit involved, but essentially if I take a finite coagent action, so phi is a deformorphism, and G is an element of SL2R, it acts on these objects. And if you work out the action, so the action of deformorphism is just the usual pullback action, there's no worry about that. Uh, and now uh, the action of the, the SL2R elements, <clears throat> it acts homogeneously on, on on SL2R by, you know, uh, conjugation here. Uh, so that's not a surprise. Uh, but uh, there is a, it, it creates a shift of the, of the momenta. Okay, so that's a, that's a complication in the action. And it's typical of, uh, of uh, semi-direct uh, uh, action. So let's say for Poincaré, this uh, shift here, PT will be something like the angular momenta, G mu nu, and then the shift is the, and the angular momenta has a component which is spin and, and, and orbital angular momenta. And this would be the orbital angular momenta, if that speaks to you. So, okay, so that's the technical problem we, we're bound to solve. We want to understand the structure of these orbits. Let's also note that, let's say, if the group is abelian here, somehow it's clear that this, this object is fixed here uh, uh, by, uh, by the action of the, uh, you know, the subgroup and, and, and the analysis simplifies considerably. So to classify the orbits, uh, um, we're going to give a, an analogy with the classifications of orbit of the Poincaré group, okay? In the Poincaré group, we also have a semi-direct product, which is the homogeneous factor is the Lorentz group, it's act on R4. And um, um, so R4 is usually called, the, it's the normal subgroup, and then SO31 is the quotient uh, uh, group. Okay, so the normal subgroup, uh, the generator of the normal subgroup are the momenta, P mu, okay, and the normal subgroup invariants uh, are simply, you know, there's two invariants for, for Poincaré. The first invariant, which is the normal subgroup invariant, is the mass square, which is P mu square. And there too, there's a notion of uh, 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 generic and, degen you know, uh, and degenerate orbits. Uh, if my M square is equal to zero, this is kind of a degenerate orbit, and you need more information to classify it. Uh, for generic orbits, uh, uh, to go further, we need to understand um, what is the little group. The little group is the group fixing uh, uh, P mu, and this group is uh, the rotation group around the vector P. Okay, and um, because we have a, a subgroup, which is this little group, we need to construct uh, the little group generator, which is the, uh, called the Poly-Lubansky vector. And this Poly-Lubansky vector, the way you can <clears throat> understand it generically is that it's somehow um, a, a map between uh, G star, the full Lie algebra, and the little group uh, uh, Lie algebra. And in Poincaré, this uh, Poly-Lubansky generator is simply given by the, the wedge product of uh, P mu, which is the momenta generator, and the angular momenta, which is the generator of SO3. Okay? And then once we have this uh, little group generator, the little group invariants, is essentially we take the square and we obtain the, the speed. Okay, so let's, uh, in order, we want to do that for the gravitational symmetry algebra. There's an extra level of complication due to the fact that the normal subgroup is non-abelian. So what we need to do is uh, first choose um, uh, an orbit uh, uh, inside uh, uh, SL2R. So if we take a point in SL2R, it has a, you know, as we have seen, it, it creates a, 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 an hyperboloid orbit. And the Casimir attached with this orbit, the Casimir, the invariants attached with this orbit, essentially the norm of that vector, okay? Now, uh, as we have seen, we have seen different, uh, uh, that there's different orbits. Uh, now in gravity, uh, we have one restriction is that the, the, the sphere metric is, um, is an Euclidean, you know, sphere. So that's what we're looking at. And if you work out the details of what that means, it means that uh, um, the norm of that vector uh, has to be positive definite. Yeah. Okay. Essentially, it means that the orbit we have to select at every point on the sphere is uh, uh, the continuous series orbit or the, or the one-shaded hyperbolic orbit. 
But what it also means is that we can take the square root of n squared, and this gives us a measure, uh, a density form, uh, an area form of S. Okay? And uh, that projection from SL to R to R uh, is uh, correspond to a choice of orbit representative where we pick one, one vector given an area form, we can pick one, one representative. Um, okay, so uh, essentially after we have done a symmetry breaking, you know, the effective group of symmetry is the, the group of symmetry diff S semi-direct product RS. And this group of symmetry, uh, this is where the connection with hydrodynamic centers is really the hydrodynamical group. So, uh, it's the group of symmetry of, uh, of uh, not only, you know, barotropic fluids, so fluids which also have a, a non-zero dependence uh, of the entropy on the, on the pressure. Okay, and in this analogy, interestingly too, for people who are working, uh, uh, this group DFS times RS is also the same thing as the BMS group. So the, BMS, the extended BMS group has exactly this structure. Uh, so it, it appeared in, in gravity. Uh, in this analogy, what's happening is that the area form, that is the Casimir, the SL2R Casimir, uh, uh, at least the, the square root of the SL2R Casimir, plays the role of the fluid mass density. Okay, so that's the setup. And now we can run down the analogy with the Poincaré group. So uh, uh, the analogy is that in one case, the physical system is the relativistic particle, and in the other case, uh, it's a space-time region. The group is a semi-direct product group here. Um, for Poincaré, the normal factor is R4, and the quotient group is the Lorentz group. For gravity, uh, uh, the normal factor is these functions on SL2R, and uh, the quotient group is, uh, you know, diff S. Now, what labels the representations of the, of the normal subgroups are the momentum here, and we have seen that what replaces the momenta is an area form on the surface, okay? The quotient group generators uh, here are the angular momentum. And uh, here they are the generator of diffeomorphisms, which we have seen are the momentum density, the, the, the fluid momentum. So we have somehow a fluid picture here that the, the representation theory are characterized by an area form or a density and, um, and, a, and a momentum density. And the fluid has, has some velocity. So the first invariant uh, in Poincaré is the mass, okay? And quite remarkably, uh, what it corresponds to is essentially the only invariant you can construct with the area form, which is the total area of the sphere. So this is the first thing we, we learn, is that this object, the area, doesn't appear in that context as a, as a geometrical object, but really as a, as a, as a as an algebraic object, as, as the first, uh, and in fact, the fundamental Casimir that organized the representation theory of, of uh, our symmetry group. And that gives us hint that, okay, well, if it's a Casimir, it may make sense that maybe the entropy or the number of states or the density of states depends on the area, okay? Otherwise, it's totally mysterious why, why a, a geometrical entity would, would be related to a counting of states. But we need to go beyond that. That is, this is only one part of the group. We need to understand, you know, uh, and classify what are the energy of the spins. So the, you know, um, for Poincaré, the Lille group is SO3. Now, uh, the Lille group here uh, in, in the gravity case is the group of symmetry. So it's the subgroup of diff S that preserves the area form. The same way that SO3 is the subgroup of Lorentz group that preserves a given momentum. Okay, and this is the, this is the group of area preserving diffeomorphisms. And we have seen already that, uh, it, you know, in area preserving diffeomorphisms, uh, 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 one of the key uh, uh, objects, one of the key invariants was the vorticity. Okay, so this is the next level is that we want to construct, and this is somehow the crux of the, of the matter, is to construct the Lie group generator. So the analogous of the poly Lubansky uh, pseudo vector, which is here, uh, um, uh, a generalization of the notion of vorticity. So this, we call it the generalized vorticity. It contains an element, which is just the usual vorticity, the uh, derivative of the fluid velocity, if you want, plus something that you can think of maybe as some kind of orbital component, and then plus something which is due to the fact that there's this internal normal subgroup, uh, uh, which is kind of a spin component, okay? So 
uh, we had these expressions for a while and uh, you know we were very happy to finally derive it uh, but we always wonder what what it really means and then uh, uh, you know William finally found in some obscure reference uh, on monopole that that this type of structure already appears and it appears in particle physics when people study the the Georgie Glasher model, which is a, a model of symmetry breaking from SU2 to U1. And, and there they were able to construct the monopole connection as a, as a symmetry breaking uh, smooth connection. And the form of, uh, so this connection was studied by, I mean, the, the structure was studied by uh, uh, Toft and Polyakov to construct the monopoles. And then later, uh, Oli finally wrote down what is this, uh, uh, the exact form of the U1 connection, which is the monopole coming from the, from the symmetry breaking. And this is exactly what this, this form appeared. So here, uh, uh, we understand now that this, this uh, form and the representation of the vorticity comes from somehow this symmetry breaking from SL2R to R. There's a beautiful geometrical story. So now we have all the elements and we can finally compute the energy of the spin, okay? So in Poincaré, there's only one invariant, but in our group, it's infinite dimensional groups there is uh, you know, an infinite number of invariants, which are uh, these generalized anstrophy. So they are the moments of, uh, of this uh, generalized vorticity here. So that's kind of gives the general uh, uh, classifications of orbits. And let me summarize the results. So we have seen that the generator of deformorphism is a density value uh, one form, the momenta. Uh, the generator of ARI preserving deformorphism is the generalized vorticity that I write here, which has these uh, two components uh, uh, that comes from the symmetry breaking mechanisms. And the Casimirs are, are the moments of this uh, generalized vorticity. Uh, and n runs from zero to infinity. So now for n equal to zero, what we have is that C0 is the area, okay? C1, in fact, is a very interesting object. Uh, um, uh, it's the to top knot charge. In fact, it measures, it's the churn class for the, the, this normal bundle, right? The non so it measures the non-triviality of this normal bundle. And, and C2 is, you know, uh, this higher uh, uh, invariance, uh, anstrophy, which are, you know, uh, the, the fluid analogs of spins. Now, what's interesting in this construction is that, uh, of course, A depends on the scale. So if you rescale the metric, if you make a conformal transformation, uh, uh, a change, but all the other uh, uh, invariants uh, um, there are conformal invariants. Okay, so so A is the only object. The area is the only object that depends uh, 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 on the on the local scale. And what what that suggests is that, um, in fact, you can define let's say a, a notion of algebra. Uh, for the rescale generator, that is, suppose you normalize the area of the sphere to be one, you can look at the algebra of this normalized generator. And what you're going to see is that this algebra of normalized generator contains a one over a factor here in the commutation relation. So what that means is that when you're looking at asymptotic algebra, algebra near infinity, you're just uh, essentially, you know, uh, growing this uh, uh, A. And from the algebraic point of view, you're taking a semi-classical number. Uh, what this means to me is, is the fact that you will never uh, be able to get the proper understand, non-perturbative understanding of gravity by studying it just from the point of view of an asymptotic symmetry. Because this asymptotic symmetry, what it does is, is kind of looking at the spectra of your representations very high in the spectra where you can ignore any spectra gaps. Uh, so you, you have to go and understand uh, uh, you know, beyond uh, uh, asymptotic symmetry. You have to go inside. Uh, but what's nice is that here you see that somehow there's maybe a very nice way to coarse grain and, and relates to different uh, uh, symmetry algebra, different scales, because it's, they're only controlled by one parameter. Okay, so uh, maybe I'm running late. I might, I might take uh, five or 10. Do I have like five, 10 more minutes if I want to? Yeah, maybe five, yeah. Okay, so, okay, now that we have the symmetry group and we have classified the representation, I need to tell you it was very abstract, very mathematical, uh, but I need to connect it to the gravity. So I need to give you uh, 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 the representations of this algebra in terms of the gravity variables, right? I haven't done that yet. 
Uh, so essentially the construction of the moment map, what is the relationship of this uh, dual Lie algebra to the gravitational variable? So in gravity, suppose we have a sphere, we can choose adapted coordinate where the sphere is at xi equals zero. So this is the normal coordinate, tangential coordinate. And we can decompose the sphere coordinate, the, the metric like that. There's a normal metric, uh, there's a tangential metric, and then there are kind of a, you know, mixing terms, which are this uh, normal lab CV. So that's the most general metric uh, around the sphere. Uh, now, um, given a two sphere embedding in 4D, we can construct the normal form, which is essentially the wedge product of the x0, the x1, and its component, the component of the normal, normal form are called nij. They are essentially square root of h, the determinant, and then uh, epsilon ij is the anti-symmetric tensor, and we raised one index with the normal metric. Okay, that's one component. And we have another component, which is very important, which is the twist uh, one form, and which is constructed uh, as follow. If you take like X and Y, two normal vectors, you compute their commutator, uh, and you, you, you take, which is their Lie bracket, I mean by commutator, I mean their Lie bracket, and then you take their tangential components, okay? You can show that uh, this contribution is proportional to a, a one form, times uh, the contraction of the normal vectors uh, with the normal form, okay? So we're interested into this object. This is the twist vector. It measures the non-integrability of the normal bundle, if you want. Uh, um, uh, the fact that the, the normal bundle is not, uh, does not form a, a, a surface, okay? And it can be written explicitly in components in terms of this VI as some kind of a curvature element. Okay, the detailed expression doesn't matter, but these are kind of the two uh, building blocks, okay, the, um, of, of the geometry around, uh, around that metric. Um, now, uh, what is the moment map? Okay, so the moment map uh, there is very simple, is that we have seen that the sl 2 r Casimir was a density, and the moment map is essentially that you take the area form, square root of Q, and you identify it with the density. The normal bivector elements, uh, SL2R, is that you take this, uh, you know, normal uh, 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 form, NIJ, contracted with uh, uh, your, your preferred Pauli matrices, uh, and take the density version of that. And that's your NT log A. So essentially, NT log A is really the, this normal uh, uh, bivector density. Okay? Uh, the twist momenta, well, you take the twist, you know, you densitize it and that gives you the momenta. So the twist is really the momenta of the fluid. So this is the, here in blue, I would say this is the gravitational uh, version. And in black, this is the coagent orbit version. Okay. So the twist form is identified with the momenta. And now remember, initially we talked about this outer curvature, which is this fundamental invariant of embedding to sphere. And uh, what's remarkable, um, I find, I mean, maybe not surprising, but absolutely remarkable, is the fact that the outer curvature, which is the, the fundamental invariant beside the induced metric attached to an embedded two sphere, is in fact uh, the fluid vorticity here. Uh, okay, so the outer curvature that we've seen is the normal bundle curvature is the uh, outer vorticity. Um, this outer curvature, I haven't given you, I've given you one formula earlier, but you can work out its definition and write it in terms of the, the Riemann tensor. Uh, okay, so the outer curvature is uh, this particular combination uh, uh, of the Riemann tensor and the explicit curvature. And you can check that in fact, from this uh, formula, that this subject is, is conformally invariant. It's, it's not obvious, but this is a, a fundamental property of this outer curvature. Okay, oh. so he, yes. A uh, quick question. Does the outer curvature correspond to the generalized vorticity or the standard vorticity? The generalized vorticity. Oh, very good. Yeah. No. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. The, sorry. I should have said the generalized vorticity. And that's why it gives you another understanding why the generalized vorticity is a bit more complicated because it really is computing a component of the, of the vial tensor. In fact. Okay. Great. Uh, so of course it's not, uh, it's a, it's a nonlinear object. So it means that now the curvature, uh, which are the invariants that I give you to sphere, fundamental invariant is of course the area that was known, 
But there's other uh, fundamental invariants which are the moment of the outer curvature. Okay, so, you know, as I promised, it was only five minutes. I can now just, uh, you know, I have only two more slides. I just want to kind of a, take a breather and, and first summarize uh, what we have seen. So uh, in this talk, uh, what I've done is that we have, we have, we have you know, I have given the, the classification uh, of coagent orbits of the coronal uh, asymmetry group. And I've emphasized that understanding uh, uh, this classification is, um, is a first step. It's a key step towards really understanding the, the quantization of this, of this group and therefore the quantization of, of geometry itself. Uh, along the way, and that's honestly really not what we were looking for. We were focusing on the gravity. We, we found something I found, you know, I, I found absolutely fascinating is this deep connection between 4D quantum gravity and 2D quantum hydrodynamics. Uh, um, I mean, halfway through the project, I was, I think, reading, starting to read more papers about quantum superfluid than, than about, you know, gravitational solution, which was a, an absolute delight. Uh, of course, you know, with insight, it's not totally surprising. I mean, you know, it's not the first time that there's some connection like that appearing. Uh, first is really the membrane paradigm, which I think is really at the core of all of what we're doing. And also more recent, there's this fluid gravity correspondence that has developed this, uh, this uh, uh, connection uh, a little bit deeper than the membrane paradigm in some way in the ADS holography setup. But here we have a, we see some kind of quasi-local version and also quantum, something which has now uh, a, a more of a quantum connection between the two. And we have revealed a new sets of invariants which are worth studying from a gravitational perspective. And now I'm eager to understand what is the role of these invariants that is uh, besides the area, they should play a fundamental role in gravity, which are these generalized anthropy. And they generalized, as I said, the notion of area, which was known, and the notion of top node charges, which was also known. Uh, now for the future, uh, there's a lot of things to look at, because it looks uh, uh, a little bit like, a, you know, we're opening many new doors there. So the first thing, of course, is to develop the construction of these unitary representations, understand their character, maybe understand their Planck-Schell measures and see how they can fuse together. That's, that's a big aspect, of course. Um, one thing I'm particularly excited about is, is thinking about these gravity hydrodynamic correspondence. And, and it, it, if you think about it, it changes completely your perspective about quantization of geometry. So it, let me give you a hint of that. So we have seen that the, you know, the, the, these representations are, are essentially characterized by uh, the classic, you know, the, the classification of representation essentially given by the choice of two, two forms. One two form on the sphere is the area two form, and the other two form on the sphere is the generalized vorticity, okay? So now, if we go back and say, oh, this is, uh, let's take the fluid uh, uh, picture of that. We know that in fluid, in fact, uh, uh, the area to form that therefore co corresponds to the fluid density. And we know that when we quantize a fluid or a quantum fluid is really uh, corresponds to a, 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 a molecular fluid. The fluid is made of molecules, it's not just continuous. And the fluid molecularization is in fact completely encoded into the fact that the area to form is now not a continuous Lebesgue uh, measure on the sphere, but it has a discrete factor, delta, delta-like uh, components, okay? So the fluid molecularization is one-to-one is -one corresponds with the notion of quantization of area, okay? Um, so this is for a kind of a classical statistical fluid. Uh, now, people have also studied the quantum statistical fluid, like superfluids or, 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 or quantum whole fluids. And what these fluids are characterized uh, with, the quantum superfluids, uh, all the older quantum fluids, in fact, are characterized by vortex quantization. So that is, uh, the vortex two form is no longer a continuous variable, but sum of delta function, if you want. And vortex quantization is the core of, of superfluidity. And it means, you know, on the gravitational that not only we, should, we need to quantize the area, but the quantization of, it corresponds to the quantization of curvature. So essentially what I'm saying here is that besides the representations, the smooth representations we have, we have uh, studied, there's the possibility to, you know, uh, uh, look at the molecularization of the fluid and, and, and the quantization of the fluid. Um, and that's, that's 
a completely new perspective to me. Okay, now we have also seen that the symmetry breaking pattern SL2R to R, uh, which is encoded into the constructions of this generalized vorticity, uh, suggests a deep connection between the corner symmetry group, which is based uh, with SL2R, and the extended BMS group, because the extended BMS group is DFS times RS. And, and it would be uh, important to understand better this connection. The reason there's such a symmetry breaking pattern is that if I have an entangling sphere and I choose a null, uh, a null direction uh, along which I'm going to translate, then this null direction belongs to the SL2R uh, group. It's the beginning, it's a boost. But then when I move along that boost, you know, it becomes a super translation. And that preferred direction you know, breaks down the, the, the rotation. So it, there should be a way to connect these two representations. And, and then finally, something absolutely fascinating too is the fact that at the core of the construction, we have seen that the area preserving diffeomorphisms are the key, okay? These are the little groups. Uh, and we know that area preserving diffeomorphism admits a, a fuzzy sphere regularization where you know, they're replaced by a large SUN group. And we can wonder whether you know, uh, such a fuzzy sphere regularization exists for gravity. And I thank you. Mark, how do I stop the sharing and then? Laurent, um, I think at the bottom of your screen, you can. Uh... Um, is that okay? You don't see my screen anymore? No, we still see your screen. Um, there should be a red button at the bottom of your. Okay, here. Yeah, good. Yeah, okay. thanks a lot. So if there are any extra questions, maybe. I know it was, it was I guess, technical, but uh, feel free to shoot. Yeah, I, I have, a, I don't know how you. Yes. Yeah, yeah I have a, a sort of naive question. So I'm a bit surprised that uh, the, the normal metric is not playing any role here, this HIJ that you wrote down. I, it's, not appearing. Oh no, the yes. normal metric is, is appearing. Maybe I went fast. So let me, okay, let me share again. Oh, that's, that's a very important point. Uh, the normal metric, uh, the normal metric plays a key role. Um, sorry, do I? So, okay. The normal metric plays a key role is that the normal metric uh, HIG is in fact, if you forget this kind of decoration factor there, okay? The normal metric is the same thing as this uh, generator NIG, the normal generator, right? So what, the, what I'm saying here is that the normal metric is essentially the SL2R generator, okay? So the, the normal metric, well, you know, what we write, what we wrote down is that you can write down the commutation relation of this normal metric and they generate an SL2R algebra. Okay. So the, the normal metric under the moment map becomes uh, uh, becomes the SL two R generator. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It, it's 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 very very. In fact, you could. You could say there's one object that does not seem to pay. So, you know, the metric has, has three components, the normal component, which is a key. This is the normal subgroup. Like this is, this is the thing that controls the normal bundle. So of course it plays a central role right, right there, right? It's the thing that plays. Then, then there's this twist which somehow is the, you know, you know like the off diagonal elements of the metric that, that tells you how your, your, your sphere is sheared when you kind of move in the normal directions. Um, and there's the, the, the volume or the scale of the tangential metric that plays a role, okay? What, what you could find surprising is that in this construction, it looks like the, the, the traceless component of the, of the metric does not play a role in that symmetry algebra, okay? Uh, and th this is where it connect, you know, so in, in that algebra, it does not play any role. It commutes, it's essentially, it's a commutative factor that you can tag along, the, you know, the, they form linear representation. And, and if you turn on, you know, in the first order formalism, if you turn on uh, what we call the image parameter, then this component of the tangential metric now plays a role, okay? So 
it's something I haven't emphasized, but it's true that you have three components of the metric and each one of them has an algebraic understanding. So you can, you can, you know, go from your, your uh, geometrical hat to the algebraic hat. And, and, and once you're in the algebra, and this is what the cohesion to orbits method allow you to do. And then, and then you can forget that the algebra element you're talking about are geometrical, but, or, or you can remember, and that's kind of this beautiful confusing, confusion of genre that I think it's the start of, of quantization. I hope that's clear. All right, any more questions? I have a little question if I can. Sure. Uh, yeah, uh, I was wondering about uh, what's missing from your analysis of the quadrant orbits to get all the unitary representation. Do you think you have them all like or what's missing? Is it something to some proof that the entropies are, are all the possible invariants, uh, or is it some analysis of the integrability of a symplectic structure, or, or is it? Uh, I, I think we have all. Um, um, we, so what we have for for sure is the analogous of we have let's say all the massive representations of Poincaré group. Okay. Uh, that that is really what what we have um, now. You see, to classify the orbits at some point, uh, and it was kind of under, un, un, underneath. I, I assume a form of smoothness. So if you think about, uh, so there was a key moment where I say, well, I have a density, okay, and square, okay, on the sphere, and I demand this density to be uh, strictly positive, okay, and therefore to be uh, uh, continuous with respect to the Lebesgue measure. Okay. Once I decide that, I think I have all the unitary representation, um, and and because these these orbits are non-compact, the isotropic group is non-compact. I don't expect any quantization condition in that in that setting. But um, you could revisit that, and you could say, well, uh, you know, I I could relax this this uh, smoothness condition. I could say, well, what if what if my representation is labeled by uh, by densities or, or two forms, which are uh, you know which, which are discrete measures, okay, and this one will enter and 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 this corresponds to in fact in fluid mechanics we have the two you know the the the, the fluids which are made of molecules are are in one to one correspondence with representations of the area preserving diffeomorphism where the density is the sum of delta function. That's essentially so even the the quant, the molecular fluid are, are a representation. So, you know, there's a, there's a bit more leeways there because the, the Casimirs are functional. But for the one I've described, I think no, we have we have all. Um, what I haven't done is construct explicitly the vectors and construct the characters, for instance, you know, and, and the observables. But it's not. Yeah, it's uh, just just more work. I think there's no. Okay. Mark, I, oh, okay. Go ahead. I mean, we, we, have, we have the complete sets of invariants. So, I mean, I can say for sure that the unitary representations, which have a definite positive metric on the spheres, are going to be entirely classified by these entropy invariants. Yeah, modulo, there's a, anyway, we, in the paper we, de, we describe exactly more precisely what are the invariants. They're, they're just not just these integrals, there's there's extra technical subtlety, but we have all of them. We do. Uh, um, and yeah, and, and if you think for people who work in loop gravity, uh, it's mostly that you know the new data here is the representation of the diffeomorphism. So all these invariants are really invariants associated with diffeomorphism symmetry. Yeah, I had a question, but I don't know the time frame, so I don't mind asking later. If no, I think it's you know. Free maybe, maybe for the discussion, we can cut the the, the register. We can have a more free discussion if you the recording. Uh, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, 